introduce, to introduce two speakers. So, we are in the home stretch. Are we excited about the home stretch? All right, if you're excited, turn to the person next to you and give them a high five or a fist bump if you prefer. Excellent, excellent. Okay, we're all awake. Excellent. Our speakers are ready to go, so I'm going to introduce them fast so we can just keep on going. Okay. My name's JC McCauley. I'm Naisha McCauley, and, and you're, you're watching, watching AccessTV.org. Access uh, with us for to uh, end out the day, we have Craig Bailey, who is an associate research scientist at the Yale Child Study Center and the director of early childhood at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. Craig and his team facilitate professional development workshops for the ruler approach with early childhood educators develop content for practicing and teaching emotional intelligence, and conduct psychological, educational, and in intervention research. That is a big, big mouthful. Excellent. And with him, we have Sarah Caden, who is the program manager of Ruler for Early Childhood at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, where she provides professional development training and support, as well as content and connectivity for the early childhood community. So can we please welcome our two speakers who are going to bring us through the home stretch. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so in the beginning of the day, one of the things that Jane asked us to do was put away our phones. Um, I'm actually going to say um, take your phones out because um, I have an activity. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take out your phone and if you don't have your phone with you that's fine. Um, I want you to think of um, a memory and I want you to focus on the feeling word joy. So I want you to go through your phone I want you to find a picture that represents joy for you. For you. And when, I, when you pick out this, this picture I really want you to consider like what does joy even mean? So joy um, is different than happy. So happy might be um, you're happy that they were serving cookies at lunch. Um, joy is something a little bit different. So I want you to think about what is joy? What does it mean to me? And what picture represents joy for me? And then the next thing I want you to do when you find this picture, I want you to turn to someone next to you, and I want you to share that story with them. And then when, when, I, when you share this experience, I want you to consider, well, what was going on? Who was I with? What did it, feel like. And I want you to tell that story to them. So take a couple minutes um, once you find that picture of, um, that represents joy for you and share with your neighbor. Go ahead. Okay, I'm going to ask you to all come back to center, wrap up your conversations, focus on the front. Okay, can I ask if um, if you shared uh, if you shared a picture and a story about family, could you raise your hand? Very very common. Okay. Um, what about a uh, pet? Anyone? Pets. I know there's always the people who share pictures of their pets. Okay. Um, what about uh, vacation or anything like that? Maybe anyone taking some vacations recently? Um, what else? Did anyone have anything that doesn't? What did you have? A double rainbow. A double rainbow. Okay. What? Uh, anyone else? Yeah. Drop the mic. There's joy for you right there. Very good. Okay. And anyone, anyone, any, um, anything else that's that was unique. Most of, most um, people when they do this activity, and I've done it 
um, hundreds if not thousands of times. It's usually family, and then you have pets, vacation, and then um, there's always these sort of unique circumstances. Um, Sarah, what, oh, actually, well, here's the picture that I always share. Thanks, Sarah. Um, so this is my family. So I have a, um, a three-year-old and a one-year-old at home. Um, it's one of the things I love about presenting is that I get to show cute pictures of my family. Um, but the other reason why I'm showing you a picture of my family is that everything we're going to talk about today um, in terms of emotional intelligence and changing um, climate, an emotional climate, it's not just something that, um, that exists in a classroom or in a school. Um, these are things that I bring home into my, um, I bring into my own home. Um, these are things that impact my relationship with my colleagues. And that's something I want you to consider is that um, the work that, that I'm going to be talking about, and really um, all of us today have been talking about this idea that adults are important too, and maybe the, the um, impact on adults is some of the more harder work. So changing adult practice, changing adult perspectives. Um, we were talking about um, a little bit ago um, the challenge of um, bringing an entire team on board. And that's a very challenging work. Um, so I used to be a preschool teacher, um, much similar to my, my colleagues. Um, I had, at one point, I had about 23-year-olds um, in a classroom, um, which definitely shaped my life and my career. Um, but let me tell you, the work with, my, th with those three-year-olds, in some respects, was much easier than some of the challenges I had in working with adults. Um, adults is, um, working with adults um, can, is some of the most challenging work that I've ever had, even, even today. Sometimes I, I look back on my, um, on my experience and I think, man, I wish I just was back in that classroom. It was so, so much easier. Um, so that's a perspective that I want to bring to you all, is that this work that we're doing about change, it's, yes, it's at the classroom level and, and it's making an impact um, on an individual, a three, four, and five-year-old, um, but this change at, at our level is about changing adults um, and really this two-generational approach to our work. And um, before I continue, Sarah, what, did, what, what is your picture of joy that you... I just said to Craig, if I showed you a picture, it would probably be of like some luxury leather good that I found deeply discounted on sale. Um, he said that might be happy, but I don't know. I don't know. I'm an emotional intelligence expert. It feels like joy to me. Very good. Okay. Next slide. So one of the reasons why I like to do this activity is that it is... Um, um, a demonstration that emotions are always all around us. You're experiencing emotion right now, um, and even the uh, one way to upregulate emotion is it's in our pockets throughout our day. Um, so we're co constantly taking pictures, often um, of things that we want to remember. Um, and you know, something that a strategy I used to use when I was first presenting, um, before I would go on stage, I'd be sort of in the back and I'd be shaking, and I would take out my phone and I would look at a picture of um, one of my children, um, or actually a video of um, my son laughing, of him giggling and laughing, um, and it totally changed my, my emotion, and then I was ready to get on stage. Um, it was a way for me to help regulate my emotion. And it's just a demonstration that emotions are always around us. Um, but the other thing that I love about this activity is that it was a demonstration that you all are, on some level, emotionally intelligent. That activity itself required you to have an understanding of what joy represents. And not only just a, sort of a definition, but what joy represents to you, uh, a personal meaning to this idea of joy. And then you had to sort of go back and be able to identify it into, into, um, in one of your memories and in a picture. So you had to f scroll through and you're like, what, what's the picture where that really captures what I'm thinking about in terms of joy? And then you had to, to communicate it with the person next to you. You had to share this experience with them. And the act of sharing an emotional experience and connecting with someone, that's what empathy is. Um, we all are always talking about empathy. Well, there it is, um, right there, the shared emotional connection based on how we communicate our emotions with, with other people. And so on many levels, we all just now demonstrated that we're all emotionally intelligent. But something for I want you to take, um, take into consideration is that children are walking into our classrooms um, and they don't have these skills. Um, they struggle to think about emotion. And if you were to ask a three-year-old what joy means and represents and to have a conversation, they may not know. Um, and, but if you say something like, well, joy is similar to feeling, feeling happy, they might have a sense of what that means. 
Um, so they have a, um, a lot of three-year-olds have a basic sense of what these emotions mean, but um, joy, they don't have that. And being able to communicate it, that's another um, task in and of itself. And so the idea behind um, the work that I'm going to be talking about is really about giving children um, the skills um, and adults, too, to be able to think about, to be able to talk about, and to be able to manage their emotions as um, some key skills in what we call emotional intelligence. So um, as, the, um, um, as we are introduced, we're both from the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. And our mission at the Yale Center for Emo uh, Emotional Intelligence is to use the power of emotion to create a healthier and more equitable productive and compassionate society. Um, and one of the things we realized early on is we can't do this alone, um, either in Connecticut or across the country. And so um, over the past um, 10 years, we've been developing partnerships and relationships, um, especially in Connecticut, to really bring this work home because it, you know, we're, we're all sitting in our offices in, in New Haven, um, and how can we really make an impact all across the state and all across the country? So one of the things that we do at our center is relationship building and forming partnerships um, with like-minded individuals. Many of, um, of you are in the room right now. You may have heard of us talk, and we've had a conversation about bringing this to schools and bringing this to your community. Um, and that's something that we view as fundamental to our work. We can't, we can't do it by ourselves. Now, in terms of our, um, of our impact, we've been working all over the world, um, which is um, a very interesting experience that when we first started this work um, of, of incorporating emotional intelligence in schools, um, the people who are jumping, um, who, who are sort of calling us nonstop, were not in the United States. Um, they were in um, Europe. They were in um, Australia. And our work actually, um, a lot of our work, um, um, when we were really impacting di districts, was there. Um, some of our work when we really started getting um, started was also in, um, in New York, um, Long Island, some New York City public schools. Um, and so when we get the statistic here, 600 pre-K um, to 12 schools all over the world, um, a lot of that work started all over the world but, um, and not so much even in our own backyard. Um, now most of the work we've done um, recently has been in Connecticut. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of um, about two years ago, I started working with um, family child care providers, um, and that's been one of the things that had been mentioned um, today about the importance of working with those folks, because those folks are often sort of left to the wayside. Like um, They're the ones who have, we know the least about, and the ones that often don't get included in professional development opportunities. Um, and so it's, it's one of the priorities that we have, and so one of our key partners, um, including um, Jane here in Hartford, is all our kin. Um, because of the work they've been doing even across Connecticut. Um, in terms of where we're headed and all these different partnerships, um, I'm not going to go through all of this, but one of the most unique partnerships that we have is actually with um, the WWE, believe it or not. Um, they have a bullying program, and so they came to us and they said, hey, um, you all are experts in um, emotional intelligence and social emotional learning. Could you help us with this bullying program they're wanting to get off the ground? And we said, sure, that's a great partnership. Um, and that's been a great partnership um, with the Boys and Girls Club and, and Playworks. Um, another thing I want to draw your attention to is the research piece, some of which I'm going to talk about a little bit today. Um, that are at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, everything that we talk about, our, our approach, is based on science. It's an, there's an evidence base for it. Um, similar to um, my colleagues who, who spoke earlier, and some of the research um, that was presented is research that I even cite um, as um, um, building the importance of our work. It's very interesting, sort of, the, um, the cross-pollination be between our work. Um, but something that I'm really excited about is the last, um, so on research, the pre-K and K through five efficacy studies um, were finalists with the federal government to test the efficacy of ruler in um, preschools um, in Connecticut and then in um, elementary schools in Virginia. And that's something that we've been applying to the federal government for for years, for years and years and years. So we're really excited about um, getting those projects out the, off the ground to continue testing and making sure that this works, um, and it works well, and it works well for everyone. Go ahead. So um, as I said, a lot of our work has been, um, up until recently, has been outside of Connecticut. And something our center decided to do recently is to, um, to, to take a pause on that. Um, so stop saying yes to sort of everyone else 
and look at our own backyard and say, well, what about the people in our, um, what about the people down the street? What about the people, what about you all up in Hartford? Um, and we decided, um, I, it was either last year or the year before, that we were going to make Connecticut the first emotional intelligence state. Um, and so a lot of the work we've been doing recently has been um, targeting um, school districts in, in Connecticut and having conversations with school districts about what is this going to take? What are the barriers? Is it funding? Is it, um, is it programmatic, logistical? What is it? Um, and especially early childhood, it's getting into those details of, well, okay, we all know that there's, there's not a lot of funding, um, but how can we take advantage of the resources that we have? Um, what can I do to bring in funding? Is that something that, that I could do to, to support this work? Um, and so part of what I'm here to, um, to share with you is that um, this all takes, it really takes a village. We're not um, by ourselves. Um, and this is something we can all do together. It's not just our vision um, and our mission, but it's, it's collectively all of ours. Go ahead, sir. So I want to have another activity. Um, I'm going to break the room into thirds. So we'll do A, B, C. And here's what I want you to do. If you're group A, I want you to consider all the feelings that educators have, from the administration, support staff, all the way into the classroom. If you're group B, I want you to think about parents. What are all the feelings that parents have? And then group C, children, all the feelings that children have. And so at your groups, I want you to, um, and maybe if, if someone wants to write these down, what are all the different feelings that, um, that come up through the course of a day with the group that you are selected? Go ahead. Okay, y'all ready? All right, so over here, the folks that we're talking about, the feelings educators have, who would like to share something that came up in their conversation? <laughs> okay, so we have joy, frustration, overwhelmed, rewarded, motivated, exhausted, sad, honored, impactful, loved, helpless, excited again, fulfilled, inspired, passionate, appreciated, and attached. Thank you. That was a lot, huh? Did it seem accurate? Yeah, what else came up for folks over here? Oh, we had... We had some of those, but we had um, we had the love, we had anxi anxi anxiety, um, caring, proud, um, invalid, um, respected, disrespected, appreciated, overwhelmed, um, unconditionally loved, worried, exhausted, energized, and um, devalued. Some of them, not some, but we had we all talk of the ones that they had. Thank you, thank you. You noticing any patterns from what's coming up? Anything else from the front of the room? They all want to share, Jane, do you have some? Yeah. We had, I'm just going to name the ones that I think no one said. One was angry, um, sad or depressed. I think they said enthusiasm. Um, joy or happy, confident, pressured. Thank you. Parents and families. What are the feelings that we think parents and families have? Oh. <laughs> um, literally, it's all of those things. Um, so that's what we were talking about, that they go through every kind of feeling throughout the day. And, um, you know, proud joy, happiness, guilt, lots of stuff. Thank you. Anything else that felt unique to parents? You raised something guilt, right? So the, 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 when we show up as a professional, 
that comes with a lot of stuff, but when we entrust other people with our tiny humans, that comes with some different stuff. Um, anything else? Because you know I'm coming over here next. Last chance? Any, okay, anything, nothing else for parents and families? Children. What are the feelings that children have? Okay, we've got quite a list here. Um, we have anxiety, frustration, happiness, sadness, shyness, surprise, excluded, jealousy, anger, annoyance, insecurity, afraid, boredom, exhaustion, pride, embarrassment, impatience, curiosity, uncomfortable, loneliness, interested, confusion, stress, hunger, and excitement, to name a few. <laughs> and that's like all just before snack, right? That's like in the first hour of the day. <laughs> Other, first, you all are also doing an excellent job with feeling words. You're very, very um, nice job with identifying feeling words. Other feelings that we feel like children have. They got them all. Is there anything you noticed about, oh, we have one more. I think as a little one, they might feel abandoned. Thank you. Thank you. So when you hear those words in the different groups, are there any, well, we didn't notice that there were similarities. What about, so similarities here, what about similarities with the children. Did anyone hear similar feeling words? Okay, we did, right? Um, did anyone notice anything else when you were hearing those words? They match up. In what way? Of, of the feelings themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Every, every table had angry, every table had yes. sad, happy. Mm -hmm. So they pretty much line up That's right. with each individual group. That's right. Thank you. And the other thing that I heard was there was, there was pleasant and unpleasant emotions across all different groups. Um, and this is, the I guess, a fundamental point of, um, that I want to make here is that um, teaching and learning is very much about um, emotions, but it's, it's almost like an emotional roller coaster. It's, um, raise your hand if you're, if you're a classroom teacher, you're an educator, you have a group of children all the time, so you're, okay? So part of why your jobs are challenging is because it's not just your own emotions that you're having to manage throughout the day, it's, you have 20. Most of you have like 20, 25, or you know, 16. You have all those children and they all have a different emotional experience. They're bringing something different to the classroom. And so you're not just managing one child, you're managing 20 children, and then your own, and then your administrator who keeps coming in and out of your classroom, and then um, all, those, all those other interruptions that you have, and then the parents are calling you on the phone, and they have their own emotions um, that they're bringing. And this is part of why um, teaching and learning is so challenging, but um, something I want you to leave with is that this is also what connects all of us together. That the reason why uh, 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 an administrator or a teacher is angry it might be very different than um, a three-year-old, but at a fundamental level, there's both both have a sense of um, that they've they've been wronged in some way, or there's a sense of injustice or unfairness. So with a three-year-old, it might be because someone took their toy, that's why they're angry. Um, and for an adult, it's because someone keeps interrupting their, their classroom, or it, um, it's because someone um, is mistreating them in, in some way. Um, but ultimately, physiologically, the feeling is very, very similar. So the reasons might be different, but the experience of emotion is often what connects all of us together. It's one of the things that you have in common with everyone in this room, is that everyone in this room experiences emotions in some way, and we all get angry, we all get sad, we're all happy, maybe about different things, and maybe that's something we can, can, um, can connect on, but it's something you have in common. And it's one of the beauties of creating a relationship with a child is that if you have nothing in common at all, zero, nothing in common um, that you can't find, the one thing you do have is that you both experience happy, sad, angry, some of those basic, basic emotions. And that's something you can, um, at the very least, connect on. Um, so one of the things I actually wanted to do, um, maybe go back to the, one of the things I wanted to do is actually um, something similar um, that Adam did earlier, which is I want to tell a story about a time when I was a preschool teacher. Um, so the story is about this student that I have, and the student's name was Spencer. And as I tell this story, you might think, 
I have a Spencer in my life. I have a Spencer in my classroom. I have a Spencer that I've encountered over time. So Spencer, he was three years old. He was a little boy who, um, when he came into the classroom, so I was a teacher, he came into the classroom and he, he ran up to me and, and gave me a hug. So he was always like running in um, and giving me a hug. Um, and he, it, was, it was great. It's one of the things I loved about being a teacher um, is that it's like every day, you, you, it's almost like you're a rock star. You walk in and all these kids come running up to you. But Spencer was always the first one. He was always the first one to notice you walk in the room and he'd run and he'd give you a big hug. But the other thing about Spencer is that, you know, you give him a hug, you turn over here, and then 30 seconds later, he's on the ground kicking and screaming. Um, he's in the block area and some, something is getting ready to go down. Um, and it seemed like this was, um, someone mentioned all those emotions before snack. That was Spencer. Um, Spencer was going through that emotional roller coaster. And it was a huge burden on me as an educator. It was a huge challenge. I was, um, at the time when, um, if I was in a professional development, and I, I was, and they asked, what is that one child um, that you think about? I always thought about Spencer, because he was the one that was giving me um, the hardest time. And I'll never forget the first time um, that I had to, to um, take Spencer out of my classroom. And maybe this has happened um, to you all. Um, so it's just a paint a picture. It's, um, it was about five minutes to nine o'clock. Um, and, and nine o'clock is when we would, um, that's when we would start our morning meeting at circle time. So kids are co sort of coming in, but it's towards the end of that. There's, and we had, um, uh, free choice. So there was the block area, there was the writing center, and um, there's sort of different centers, and they all get to choose. And Spencer always went to the block area. Um, and so Spencer's in the block area, and I was over um, in the writing area. So over, over here, you know, I'm sort of working um, with some children over here. And then I hear this piercing scream. You know that scream that children have? Like all children have it. They find it within themselves around when they're one years old. And it, it's like it rattles your eardrums. And it, 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 it like pierces. I say piercing because it, it feels like it's piercing into your brain. So I hear that piercing scream and I knew that something was going to go down. But I, you know, it's a classroom. It's, you know, there's um, you know, the, the block area is way over there. And so I turned and I started marching my way over to the block area, and I, I started speeding up because I noticed that um, as Spencer was screaming, he had one of those um, long blocks, you know what I'm talking about, the long wooden blocks, and he had a baseball bat style. Um, clock another um, kid in the head. Have you ever seen this? And so I'm like racing over, and I grab the block, and I put the block, and I grab Spencer, and I put him over here, and I said, Spencer, you can't hit your friends. And then Spencer did something that many of you have seen. Um, he ragdolled onto the floor, <laughs> right? And I don't know where children learn this. Um, it seems like every children sort of, they, they acquire this ability to sort of just ragdoll and like lose all muscle tension. Um, and he falls to the ground and he starts kicking and screaming. He was like, no, 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 no. Someone took, he took my toy. He took my toy. No, 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 no. And so I, as it's happening, I'm, I'm look, I look at the clock. I look at my co-teacher and I'm like, I got to get him out of here. It's, it's, almost, it's almost circle time. I can't have this in the middle of circle time. It was literally happening on the rug that we have circle time on. Like, I got to get him out of here. And so I'm like, okay, going to get Spencer out. Um, my co-teacher will take over. Great. Um, we'll put him outside of the room. We'll, um, we'll de-escalate and, and we'll sort of get back on track. So I pick up Spencer and we start making our way outside of the room. And then Spencer started realizing what was happening, um, and then he started, um, he went from being um, muscle, no muscle tone to start sort of kicking back and forth. And this is something that I, when I was a teacher, I never realized. Um, they should put this on the job description, um, like, must be willing to accept bruises all over your body. <laughs> I remember going home and, you know, I'm like, where did I get these bruises? They're everywhere, they're all over. Um, well, looking back, I know some of those bruises came from Spencer. So Spencer was um, kicking back and forth, and I'm carrying him. Um, and we started going down, and I, I started just talking to him. I started saying, Spencer, you know, you can't hit your friends. You can't clock your friends, you know, with, um, with a block. Um, we're going we're gonna to go outside of the room. And when I started talking to him about this, he started pleading with me. No, 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 I'll be a good boy, I'll be a good boy. No, 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 I'll, I didn't, I, I, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. 
and I was just like, Spencer, I, I'm sorry, but like, I am, I'm, you, you can't do this to your friends. And then he did something to me that may have happened um, to you before if you've worked with children. Um, Spencer slapped me in the face. You ever been slapped before? It's demeaning. Um, and so when he slapped me, this was the turning point for me because it was like, okay, you're not gonna, sl I'm a professional. You're not gonna slap me in the face. And so I thought, I'm gonna take you down to the office. You know, I, you, you're gonna have to be with, with in, uh, down in the office. Um, and I told this to Spencer, I'm like, I'm taking you to the office now. You don't, you don't hit your teachers. You don't hit anyone, let alone your teachers. You don't hit your, your mom, your dad, or, or anyone else. You don't do this. So I started marching down to the office. And um, then he did something to me um, that maybe this has happened to you before. Um, let me know if it's happened to you before. He spit in my face. You ever been spit on before? It's demeaning. It's degrading. It's, it's, it's awful. And so at this point, even like now as I'm telling this story, my, I can feel my heart going up um, and my breathing is getting quicker and quicker. And so I was like, okay, you know, at this point, I'm, I'm finished with Spencer. And I started marching quicker down to the office and I did one of these maneuvers. Maybe you've done this before. We were just like, he's yours. I'm, I'm done. I can't do this. Take him. Like I'm going back to circle time, back into my classroom. Um, and so... This is a, something that I, of course, when I look back and I think, oh, there's so many things I could have done differently, um, I absolutely regret it. Um, but unfortunately, this is something that became a pattern. So this wasn't just the first time I took him down in the office. This became a reoccurring pattern. Um, and I look back and I think, oh, you know, um, I wish that I could sort of bring what I know now. But at the time, I was at my wit's end. Like, what else? What are options? I had. I had 19 other children in my classroom. Can't start circle time um, with that. That was sort of my reasoning. Now at the time, I was also um, taking night classes. And one of my night classes was child development. And I had this instructor that drove me up the wall because I felt the instructor didn't know anything about children. He would talk about all these children in, in the, the textbooks, and I would read the, listen to him and read the textbooks and go, those aren't the children I work with. Are you kidding me? No, 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 no. These are, like, you don't know what it's really like in, in, sort of in the real world, what it's really like to be in a classroom when you have 19 um, or 20 children. You don't know what it's like. Um, and many of you have experienced it before. We had an assignment. It was a classroom observation assignment. And um, we had to go into a, a classroom, and luckily I had my own, and I had to observe a child. And I thought, oh, here's my opportunity. Not only am I going to observe Spencer, but I'm going to show my instructor that he doesn't know anything about children. I'm going to paint a picture for him um, that really demonstrates um, that he's somewhere else. Like, you know, he's, he's dealing with children that don't actually exist. So. I went back into the classroom and I really started observing Spencer. I really started paying attention. And one of the things I started realizing was it wasn't just, what, what seemed to me at the time um, was, was very, just it seemed random. You know, Spencer was always running up to me. But when I started realizing um, that he was experiencing something, that that was a way for him to, to communicate with me in some way. That when he was getting ready to clonk one of his friends in the block area, it's because he was feeling something. He was feeling an emotion. Um, that there, was, that a lot of times as educators we focus on the behavior and we overlook the emotional experience that often is driving that behavior. Um, and a lot of times we we overemphasize it so much that you can go to uh, www.challengingbehavior.org. There's a website you could go to. Um, that emphasizes challenging behavior, that some, that, um, it's so much that we overlook the emotion that, that, that is behind a lot of those behaviors. That when you, when you focus on the emotion, it actually makes a lot of sense. So going back to that block area, um, if someone takes Spencer's toy, Spencer feels like he's been um, treated unfairly, and um, he was just trying to get his toy back in the same way that I would probably go off the wall if someone steals my car. If someone were to steal my laptop, and yet as an adult, if you, if you were to go out into the parking lot right now and you were to see someone stomping around going, someone took my car, he's down the road, and they're, they're screaming, there's profanity, you would probably see that and go, well, of course, someone took his car. Like, of course, that's normal behavior. There's nothing wrong with it. And yet, when we see children 
doing that same thing in the classroom, we go, well, um, there's something wrong with that child. Um, there's something that is not right. Um, so this is something I realized about Spencer, and um, I wrote all of this up um, in a paper, this idea that emotions are at the heart of behavior, and I end up getting a B. <laughs> um, but here I am today representing Yale University, so it's my way of saying, you gave me a B, but look at me now. <laughs> I'm at Yale now. Um, now today, I have a way of thinking about what it is I learned. I learned that emotions matter, that emotions impact attention, memory, and learning, that when Spencer is coming into the classroom and he is experiencing an emotion, it is drawing his attention on whatever it is that is, um, that is at the root of, of his emotion. So um, if Spencer is angry in the block area, he's not thinking about anything that I, um, any of my agenda or anything that I want to accomplish as an educator. He's thinking about the experience um, just in the same way that um, if you're getting text messages on your phone right now because this has happened to me because um, a water pipe bursts in your basement, you don't, who cares what that guy up front is saying? Like, I have a, a water pipe that bursts and that's what I'm, I'm focusing my attention on. Emotion draws our attention. And so when children are coming into our classrooms with these emotional experiences, that's what's pulling their attention. So emotions absolutely impact attention, memory, and learning. That we ultimately remember the things that have the strongest emotional meaning um, to us. Emotions impact decision making. We often don't make the best decisions when, we have, um, when we're experiencing an intense emotion. Um, that um, even though I, what I find fascinating about young children is if you were to ask, if any of you have a, a three, four, and five-year-old, go home um, and, and just ask them um, whether or not they think it's right to hit their friends. Most of them will say, well, no, it's not. You shouldn't hit your friends. They can tell you all about sharing. They know these things. But when, you're ex when you experience an intense emotion, your decision-making is literally hijacked. The part of your brain that's, that's associated with decision making is not working efficiently. And so even though children know what to do, when they're emotionally hijacked, they're not making the decision that aligns with their best self. Even as educators, we make decisions that we regret when we're um, emotionally hijacked. It's very um, fundamental to being a human being that um, this idea of a fight or flight, when that system is activated, you're not making um, decisions that'll, that may align with your best self. Um, relationships is very, very interesting. In fact, um, could everyone sit up straight in their chair? Everyone sit up straight, okay. Um, and if you feel comfortable, close your eyes. And I want you to think about an educator that made an impact on your life. An educator that made an impact on your life. Okay, raise your hand if you um, came up with someone, at least like one person. All right. So the argument that I'm here to make right now is that the reason why you remember that person is because they made an emotional impact on your life. They made you feel something, um, for better or for worse. Um, one of my colleagues actually um, went through um, Catholic school and remembers the nuns who um, sort of would beat him with a stick. Um, and so he remembers, you know, it's like Sister Mary, right, or um, one of the sisters. Um, my, I remember the educator, um, his name was Mr. Pope. Um, he was, um, I had him in sort of uh, for freshman. Um, in drama studies. So I remember them to this day because of the way the emotional impact. Emotions are very much a part of the relationships, and I think that was a theme um, throughout the course of today, of how important that emotional connection is. Sometimes we call this attachment. Um, and then finally, physical and mental health. Does anyone know the second leading cause of death in the United States? Heart disease? Yes, heart disease. So. Um, <laughs> When I, was, uh, when I was a teacher, I, um, you know, I had a physical, and I went to the doctor, and the doctor said, you have high blood pressure. And I said, okay, that doesn't sound too good. Um, and he says, well, what do you do? And I said, well, I I'm a teacher. And he goes, oh, okay, well, um, is there any way that you could lower your stress? 
<laughs> I was like, uh, do, do you even know anything about education at all? Like, lower my stress? Are you kidding me? Um, one of the things that doctors are always re recommending um, are things like lowering your stress, and that's because of the strong relationship between um, physical health and stress. And stress is very much about how we manage our experience, and um, especially our experience of emotion. There's a strong link there. Um, does anyone know the most common um, psychological diagnosis, uh, mental disorder in the world? What's that? Depression, number two? Anxiety. Um, and I believe the statistic is 20%. Uh, 20% um, uh, of us, which is there's about 100 people in this room, it's about 20 of us, um, at some point in our lives experience clinical anxiety. Clinical anxiety. And, and this is very much a reflection of how we manage our emotions, how we manage our emotional experience. So this connection between emotion and attention, memory, and learning and our decision making, everything that's going on in a classroom, emotions play a big part of it. So much so that if, we're, if we struggle to manage our emotions, if we struggle to think about our emotions, to talk about them, um, it ends up having, having this cascade effect on every part of our educational experience. Every part of our educational experience. So we want to be very explicit in the way that we talk about trauma and the way that trauma impacts emotions. And as Craig and I have been discussing this, um, really talking through the ways that trauma is, in many ways, fundamentally an emotional experience. So here's your brain. There's probably people who know more about brains than I do. But um, when we talk about what happens in our brains, both related to our emotions, but really intentionally around trauma. There are three structures in our brains that function in the way Craig was describing, especially around attention, memory, and learning. One of the really important ones is up here. I usually, usually teach this to children under the age of 10, so I pardon the simplicity. Our prefrontal cortex is up here at the front of our head, so you can sort of touch your forehead and that's where it is. And this is where our really good thinking happens. And it doesn't develop until we're a little bit older. So our three, four, and five-year-old friends, their prefrontal cortex is not terribly well developed. Our 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19 year old friends, also still developing. But this part needs to be turned on for us to do that really good learning in the classroom where we're able to um, play with our friends unsupervised, where we're able to learn about what's happening. And it connects to another structure called the hippocampus, and that's where our memories get made. But the really big important one, and, and you can actually it's not even mentioned up there, um, is, uh, is our lizard brain. Has anybody ever heard about your lizard brain? Your, it's, the, this, the real name of the structure is your amygdala. To drill back in, it's about the size of an almond. And the amygdala is this ancient structure that we still have, and it's, it's the fire alarm of our bodies. And it's the thing that goes off when we experience a sense of danger. And so what happens is if we are experiencing a sense of danger, whether, whether I agree with you that it's danger or not, the amygdala goes off and it tells our bodies, freak out, get safe. And it sets off a response throughout our system. It releases cortisol. It sort of tenses our muscles. It tells us to either um, flee, fight, or freeze. And when it's on, the other stuff doesn't work. So if you think about, um, if you sort of think about this in the Spencer story, or I can tell you about many, 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 many of my own students, and probably many of you have your own students, that just like something, maybe a loud noise, maybe somebody raised their voice, Maybe they didn't get their toy and just kind of all hell breaks loose. Oftentimes it's the amygdala sort of taking over, right? And its job is just to keep you safe. So when we talk about emotions driving attention, memory, and learning, when we have really big emotions that are an, uh, a result of trauma, we can really see the long-term impacts, right? And, and the, I think the other thing that's really important for us to talk about with trauma and our brains is that when, have you all heard of um, adverse childhood experiences, ACEs? So when, when we talk about ACEs, when we talk about chronic and toxic stress, which is the notion of being exposed repeatedly over time to highly stressful situations, which is related to trauma, but a little bit different. When we talk about trauma, we're talking about an experience that was so overwhelming to our system 
a real or a perceived situation that threatened our lives or the lives of someone around us, so a child can have a traumatic experience where they perceive that the life of their mother is in danger. Um, you can have a traumatic experience where it is your perception and not actually the reality, which is especially important for young children, right? Because they don't know but they know something is scary. So when that gets encoded into our brains, it changes the architecture of our brains. And what, what the ACEs study, and Felitti's work about 20 years ago showed us, is the way that that gets encoded in our bodies. And when we layer that on top of the way that systems have been designed, so I always, always feel like this is critical to mention. So we are here in Hartford, Connecticut, right? Connecticut is part of a country that is part of a system of um, settler colonialism. So we are on stolen land, and we are part of systems that are built on that. We are in a place that it was built through the transatlantic slave trade that is part of a legacy that now includes mass incarceration and police brutality. So these are all ways that trauma right, manifests and is experienced differently. So there's a real impact of those things in the way that they get encoded in our bodies, but also in our systems. Make sense? Okay. So trauma and emotions, are they the same? Well, not exactly. If we made a Venn diagram, right, it wouldn't be a over, complete overlap. But traumatic experiences and trauma are emotional experiences. Yeah. Yeah, so okay, so we're instead of being ABC, now we'll be ABCD. So maybe, how about this back corner over here? Would you like to be D? Everybody else can be the same. So we're, we're gonna ask you to think about and talk at your table. Sort of we broke down what emotions drive and this is gonna shock you. Trauma impacts the same elements. So we would like you to take a moment to discuss at your table, so group A, Actually, maybe these first three tables, you can be group A, and for you to consider how you experience trauma impacting um, attention, memory, and learning, and that can be a reflection um, around your students. If you are comfortable thinking about that in your own life, you are welcome to do that, but please do not feel pressured to do that. Um, if you wanna think about sort of the families that you serve, let's do group B, these um, first, actually, group B. Why don't you be this cluster right here? I'm totally mixing it up. One, two, three, a little triangle. Um, how does trauma impact decision making? Group C, my triangle right here. So at your table, you can think about how trauma impacts relationship quality. And then everybody who is left, which I think is y'all right here, um, how does trauma impact physical and mental health? I'll give you a few minutes to have that conversation. And I'm going to ask if there's one group or one person from group A who is considering how trauma impacts attention, memory, and learning that would like to share your perception. Anybody from group A? I figured you might. I mean, this is very much what you just discussed, but, um, you know, executive functioning, which attention is a part of, and, and learning often is a part of too, is the canary in the coal mine when it comes to stress. So as, as soon as you know the cortisol gets released, dopamine gets released in the front of our brains, it shuts down prefrontal cortex function, and it makes it difficult, if not impossible, to do any of those things. Um, we were talking about our different um, kind of how we react to, to cortisol and, and, and for some of us it means freezing and kind of becoming detached. For others of us it means kind of hyper focus on one thing but ignoring other potentially important things in the environment. So we all react differently but in all three of, in all three of our cases we were talking about how those situations are just not conducive to any of that and, and how um, you know even memory which is a lot of you know processed in the limbic system kind of gets shut down because um, a lot of people who have experienced trauma don't clearly remember what was happening at the time, so. Precisely, and thank you. So one of the really important points there is, right, we often can't remember things around our trauma, and not just things around our trauma, we can't remember a lot of stuff, because that part of our brain, it's not working. The only part of our brain that's working is the keep me safe part of my brain. Um, B, decision making. I have one, one interested party share how they feel that trauma impacts decision making. You guys are C? B? B. That was here. 
Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. Who is somebody? I don't know. Raise a hand. B. B. Okay. No problem. Um, we said a couple things, but one of the things um, we mentioned was that sometimes in the case of children that have been under you know severe trauma events, they're they're so fearful of what might happen, like they never know what's going to happen. So I was saying, like in the case of making a decision they don't know which way to go. Like if I choose this, am I gonna get in trouble or this or which is the right decision to make so it could hinder their decision making. Absolutely, and what that looks like in your classroom, right? Is a kid struggling to make a decision that has no relevance or meaning? You're like, just pick red or blue, I don't care, somebody. But because you're absolutely right, because they don't know what's going to happen. And also, it's really hard to make decisions if you haven't been able to learn and think, right? How am I gonna make a decision if I don't really understand the decisions? Thank you. Group C, relationship quality. We were discussing how drama affects toddlers and preschool, preschoolers. And we came up with some things, distrust, withdrawn, unattentive, uninterested, aggressive, sensitive, defensive, isolated, unresolved conflicts, and depression. Y'all are doing my job. Um, Thank you. And so who wants to be around a child who has those those sort of outfacing? Yeah. It's right behind you with the microphone. Um, I would like to add something to what she was saying about the relationship quality. So when children are experiencing trauma, they have a lot of trusting issues with adults. And also sometimes it's hard for them to receive love or kindness or expressing them to others. Yeah, absolutely. So you pointed out two really important things, right? One is that children will have these behaviors that may not attract other children or adults to them. They're the kids that sort of get left out because they're hard to be around sometimes or we perceive them that way. And they may very well be withdrawn and not able, right? You approach them and they, it's too scary right, to have a relationship with an adult. It's too unpredictable. These are also the children that might really cling to you or cling to someone else and have a very hard time separating. Thank you. Okay, physical and mental health. Who thought about that? I know it was this corner. Good. Um, so I do, we were talking about the long-term effects of the ACEs, you know, the adverse childhood experiences and that um, physical health gets affected so people are more likely than in their life to have obesity, heart problems, whatever, and mental health also, so like things like depression, anxiety, people are just that many more times likely to have those things happen to them. Absolutely, thank you. Did you want to say something? Down? One more? Yeah. I mean, I was just thinking that I guess it's relationship quality which is that sometimes if, if you're only comfortable in traumatic situations, then it's not just that you don't trust one, it's not, but that's the only situation within which you feel comfortable dealing. So you keep trying to recreate those same relationships and situations because you feel at least, even though they're it's hard and horrible, you, you know how to deal with them. Absolutely, absolutely, it's predictable. So if I create a situation where I know you're going to push me away, at least I know what's going to happen and I'm still in control. And, and so thank you. So you brought up the data that comes from the ACEs study, right? The study 20 years ago that was initially, I mean, Flea is an obesity doctor. He was trying to figure out why people gain weight. And that study led to these discoveries around what had traditionally been thought of as lifestyle choices, right? Smoking, inactivity, sort of sedentary lifestyle, which are highly correlated with income and race and what they learned and what is now part of the way we understand science and epigenetics is that trauma gets stored in our bodies in ways that change our DNA and they impact long-term health outcomes through chronic, uh, chronic inflammatory response, so heart disease, cancer, asthma, um, high blood pressure, right? All these things that for so long we've sort of thought, oh, you're just making poor choices, right? And when you think about the ways that um, that all of these sort of form a cascade, right? If you can't do step one, you can't do step two, and this is how you get kids who graduate high school, when you layer this into the systems, 
the sort of fundamentally oppressive systems we're part of, that finish high school and are so talented, right? This is, I don't know if this is Kenton's story, but this is a lot of my high school students, right? This is their story. They can't, they read at a fifth grade level because of the behaviors and because of the cognitive sort of challenges they had due to their trauma, and they just get pushed aside. So what do we do now? A lot of the emphasis is on what we just talked about is all on sort of the, the negative, but what's the other side of this? What's the other side of emotion um, where we can empower individuals, where we can empower children, where we can empower um, parents um, and educators? Um, and this empowerment piece is um, part of at the heart of emotional intelligence. So emotional intelligence is a set of skills about how we think about, communicate, and ultimately manage our emotions. Um, there are lots of different frameworks out there. Um, the one that we use um, uh, conveniently spells the acronym RULER, so R-U-L-A-R, but it's based on um, Peter Salovey's four branch model of emotional intelligence. Um, the first R in RULER being recognizing emotion um, in ourselves and others. And this is a key piece here, your, um, the emotion in yourself and other. So when you recognize your own emotion, this is what your body is telling you. So right now, your body is constantly telling you um, about your experience. It's just that you're attending to someone, to something else. Hopefully, that's me. Might be, might be, you know, some some other distractor. But your con your body is constantly sending you these signals. Um, and part of a lot of the work on mindfulness is about tapping into those signals that are already there. So when when we work with children about recognizing their own emotion, this is about their physiological cues. This is about their heart rate, their breathing. Um, so if you've ever um, help children recognize their breathing. You could do something as simple as um, having them all lay on their backs and getting a stuffed animal, you put it on their belly, and you just do belly breathing, and they see their stuffed animal going up and down, up and down, and they have a visual cue of taking a deep breath. That's just like one example. Another one is, you've probably seen these things before with a pinwheel. Taking a deep breath and blowing the pinwheel, and they see the pinwheel moving, and they start seeing a, um, a visual cue for taking a deep breath. But ultimately, this is about the physiological cues within our own bodies. And some of us are very in tune with, with, our, um, with recognizing our own emotion. So we know in any given moment what it is we're feeling. Um, other people struggle with this. Other people really struggle with what it is their body is telling them at any given moment. Um, and sometimes it's, there, there's a threshold where I'm good right now, but when I get really, really angry, I don't even realize it. So when I'm not, when I have low arousal, I can tell you what I'm feeling. I'm feeling bored, I'm feeling tired. But when I'm angry, I have no idea. I fly off the handle and I don't even realize it. Um, me personally, I don't even realize when I'm raising my voice. Um, it's something that I'm, I, just don't, I just don't hear. So when I'm starting to get angry, that's a cue that I, I don't hear it within myself. But that's only part of recognizing emotion. The other part is recognizing the emotions of others. Um, these are all the, um, the cues, the, the facial expressions, the body posture, the voice. Um, I can tell you, if my, if my mother was, was walked into this room, I could tell you how she was feeling on the other side of the room, especially if she was standing like this. I knew I did something wrong. Um, so some children um, are, are very good at this, and they pick up on this right away. Other children really struggle with this. And some children are better at their own um, cues and, um, and struggle with others. Some children struggle with both. But ultimately, this is an indicator of their emotional intelligence. Um, even adults, some of us are very good with recognizing emotion. Um, other, um, other of us struggle with this. The U in ruler stands for understanding. This is all about the, the causes and consequences of emotion. Um, sometimes I like to refer to this as the emotion narratives um, that, we, that help us make sense of um, the things that happen in the world. Um, and what's, what I love about emotion understanding is that this is where the most value is in terms of education or teaching young children. This is where you're helping children um, understand that everyone feels different things. Um, for different reasons. That if, you're, if you've ever worked with three-year-olds, you know one of the things they're navigating is that, well, people feel different things for different reasons. Um, it, um, like, what is it that makes other people sad and that's different? Like, why wouldn't someone else feel sad for the same reason that I feel sad? 
And this is something, um, if you know any of the work on theory of mind, this is all about that theory of mind that's coming online and why preschoolers um, in particular, why they're struggling with this is because cognitively, they're just getting this ability to be able to take the perspective of other people. Um, but what I love about emotion understanding is that it's also one of the key ingredients of empathy. That when you create an emotional, when you connect with someone on an emotional level, um, it's not just because you see the emotion that they're experiencing and you feel it as well. Um, that happens with infants. So infants can, um, you have a, what's called emotional um, contagion effect where one infant cries and then you have an entire room of, of crying infants. And there's no, there's no skill there. Um, but as you get older, um, if, I notice that, if I notice that Sarah is crying, I can walk up and I can say, Sarah, tell me what happened. And Sarah can tell me a story, and I can then take her emotional perspective. That's empathy. It's not just um, watching a movie and crying because the, the, the movie is, um, is a sad movie. Like, that's something that uh, is very much an automated response. Empathy is all about emotional perspective taking. And this is the, the part of empathy that you can actually teach. So when you're reading storybooks to children and you're talking about the characters and the emotions the characters are feeling um, and how it's driving the plot and it's driving what it is the character is doing. So why is Alexander angry in Alexander a Terrible No Good Day? That's a way that you teach, empathy, um, teach emotional perspective taking um, to young children, ultimately how you're teaching the malleable aspect of empathy. It's one of the reasons why I love emotion understanding. Um, most three-year-olds, they can tell you what happy, sad, and angry, what, what they look like. So if you show them pictures of those emotions, they, they already know that. They have it down. It's something that we often, um, something they're exposed to. But um, if you want to teach them something new, it's all about um, the different reasons that people are angry, the different reasons that people are sad, the different reasons that, um, that we're happy, and then the ramifications of those. So when I get angry, I sometimes say things that, um, that I feel bad about. When I am happy, I like to be around other people. That's the, most, that, that's the growth part of emotional intelligence um, in early childhood. Um, labeling emotions, it seems really straightforward, but we don't, as adults, use the language that we want children to have. We're constantly telling children to use their words, but as adults, we're terrible at using emotion vocabulary. If you think about your own life today, you've probably said words like fine, good, okay, um, and, and then guess what? You go into a classroom and you have all these elaborate expectations about, well, why aren't children talking about their feelings? Why aren't they talking about their emotions? Well, it's because as adults, we're terrible at it, and it's part of why this work starts with adults. Um, but another reason why emotion labeling is important is because there's been research that shows that just saying how you feel helps you manage that emotion. We, we have the saying at our center, it's called name it to tame it. That when you can name your emotion, you're more likely to manage your emotion. And in fact, um, some of the um, fascinating research out there, if you look at um, recidivism in uh, drug and alcohol rehab programs, and you look at like, why is it that some people are successful in those programs, Often it's the people who are able to talk about their emotions and talk about their feelings. And if you look at the therapy that's done, it's often to try to get them to label their feelings, to talk about their feelings. And when they can do that, that's when they start being able to regulate. And so someone mentioned earlier how important communication and vocabulary is. Um, I second that, I third that, I fourth that. Vocabulary can be very powerful when um, empowering, when you're able to say, I feel sad, I feel angry. And as an adult, when, a, when you hear your child, like a three-year-old, tell you that they're angry, it's like, it's a whole new world. Because usually we're having to play this guessing game. Are you happy, are you sad, are you, are you angry, what is it, da, 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 da. is it this, is it this, is it this? It, wouldn't it be great if they just came out and just told you? Um, and this is something that I experience even in my own home. I'm always shocked, but pleasantly surprised when my three-year-old comes up to me and, and tells me that he's angry, and I don't have to do this guessing game. I have to, to figure it out. But it ultimately, it's about me using the language that I want, them to, want him to have and being intentional about it. 
Expressing emotion is um, very fascinating. This is often um, where sort of culture is embedded into emotional intelligence. The different ways that we express and communicate to others how we're feeling and how um, it's different in community, family, culture, um, all the different hierarchies that we all have different ways of talking about our feelings. Um, most of you have worked around children, and you, um, so if, if this was a preschool classroom and a child is having a temper tantrum, we would probably, we would probably be like, well, it's, you know, it happens. Like, you're going to experience children having temper tantrums in a preschool classroom. It happens. But if you experience a child having a temper tantrum, even as an early child professional, in the grocery store, that feeling, that a cringe that you get, and you're just like, oh, someone take care of the child. Even though you're a professional and you're like, I, I deal with this every single day, when it happens outside of that context, it almost physically hurts. And actually, um, there's similar receptors going on. When you feel that feeling of cringe, it's very similar to feeling of pain. And that's because there's a violation of expectation. And that's what a, um, a emotional expression is all about. But, you know, as adults, we take for granted that we know what these rules are. We take for granted that we know um, to talk quietly in a movie theater, for example, or talk quietly in a library. That most children, they don't, they have no sense of context for why is it that they um, should be using a soft voice in, in the library. And so part of the approach that we have at our center is all about intentionality. So teaching the emotions and the ways to express that you want them to have. And not just having expectations you know, where you're setting them up and um, reprimanding them for not magically knowing um, the different ways to express themselves. And then finally, 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 we get to emotion regulation. This is usually what people come to us for. They say, we need help with our students and how to regulate their emotions. And I say, well, it's not just about emotion regulation. It's about helping your students being able to recognize their emotions, to be able to understand their emotions and the emotions of others, to be able to talk about and label their feelings, to be able to express their emotions in a way that you feel good about. And that ultimately, all those skills together, that's where you get where it comes to a head, where if they have those skills, because that's how you teach emotion regulation to children. Oftentimes, we're teaching children strategies constantly, strategy, 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 but we're not teaching them when to use it. So if a child doesn't know what, what anger feels like, well, how are they supposed to use that deep breathing technique that you taught them? If they don't understand the, the different reasons why people get angry, then why would they um, use, the, use a deep breathing strategy, whatever strategy that was, in that particular context? Um, and so on and so forth. So our approach is very much about teaching these requisite skills. And then finally, when you get to emotion regulation, they have those requisite skills to use the strategy that we, most of us know and um, use as educators. One of the things that is critical for all the RULER is a strong relationship with the, with the children or the adult that you're working with. So we wanted to overlay a trauma lens into the RULER and sort of highlight some of the things that you might experience differently with people or children, adults or children that have trauma experience. And some of this already came up in our earlier conversation. So we're talking about recognition. One of the things we often notice about children or adults is a sense of hypervigilance that they are always ready and they are always scanning and noticing what's going on around them um, and that is so they're they're looking right they're looking for danger and it really relates to the third point the hostile attribution bias so one thing we know about people who have had a trauma experience is that they often perceive the facial cues the body language and the vocal tones of others in a way that falsely attributes danger because it makes sense, right? In order for me to keep myself safe, I better be over aware rather than under aware. Although, um, the third point, actually, Craig, if you just go back to point B, overlooking certain cues, um, this came up, right? That when we're talking about children who are very withdrawn, or if you ever, this could be a friend, a neighbor, a student who says, I don't know how I'm feeling, I just don't know, right? Because sometimes we get so detached from our bodies this idea of dissociation that we just can't, I can't tell you, because I really don't know. When we talk about the you, the understanding, this is where we see biased emotion narratives, right, where um, 
that, that sort of understanding the causes and consequences because we just don't, because it's not typical, because it doesn't make sense. We'll have a bias in how we perceive and understand the causes and consequences. Oftentimes we will see egocentric emotion narratives where things are really all about me and like I can't notice what's going on with others because I can't. I don't have the bandwidth. I only have the space to make sure that I'm safe. And it's sort of the inverse of that is I only have space to focus on this person who is terrifying to me. And that's a lot of times when you see children who are very um, sort of oriented towards people pleasing, right? That can be sort of a sign of like, I, if I don't keep my dad okay, then he's gonna get angry. And he's gonna start to hit me or he's gonna start to hit mom. That makes sense? Another concrete example for this is um, um, children and families experiencing divorce when the child blames himself. That's, that's a little bit what we mean by egocentric emotion narratives for others, is that they, they sort of take those emotions and they make them about like, it, it's because of something I did. Um, and, and all the bad things in the world are because of things that, that I did. Um, and all the bad things that happened to me are because I deserve it. I deserve it. So um, it's because of something that I did. And um, that's a little bit of um, is what we mean by that um, egocentric emotion narrative. And, and from a clinical perspective, right, this is something that you will see frequently. Children blame themselves. They blame themselves for things that they have absolutely no control over. And adults do it too. Uh, but they carry that with them, and because they don't have the language to talk about it, the, the divorce is a great example, because almost universally children blame themselves for their parents' divorce. Is it ever their fault? No, never. Um, do they have the capacity to say, like, I feel really sad because it's my fault, mom and dad got divorced? Nope. Um, the, the other thing you notice with people who have trauma experience is that not only do they blame themselves, but they minimize their own experience, and they will point to others who sort of have it worse. Um, and biased emotion perception, right, is just this idea that if I am taught to learn about emotion or to perceive emotion in a certain way, I'm just going to stick with that because of safety. Um, in terms of labeling, we often see inaccurate or totally misused emotion vocabulary. Um, this is because for people with that experience, especially if it's chronic, especially if it's at home, emotions are unpredictable and using certain words can be triggering to the person who's perpetrating violence against you. Um, and so the way that you learn words and emotion vocabulary just is different. Um, so it can be both inaccurate and misused, but also limited or non-existent. And this is, again, the sort of, I don't have feelings, I feel fine, I'm okay, that's it. Like my, my emotion vocabulary is those two. Something that we've found interesting is that um, struggling to come up with the accurate label for our emotions is something that it's, um, it's almost universal because of the lack of emphasis we have in our own culture and our own ed education. Um, and so we actually have a video to sort of hit some of this home, e even as adults. So think about what these emotions mean and even how even you may be inaccurate in the way you label your emotions. Let's take a closer look at some emotion words that are commonly mixed up or used incorrectly. Did you ever think about the difference between jealousy and envy? Maya sees Isabella and Evelyn out for coffee. Isabella is her best friend and didn't invite her. Why is she hanging out with Evelyn and not her? Maya feels jealous. Now consider Kate. Kate sees Maya at school in a brand new designer outfit. Kate could never afford that outfit. Kate is envious of Maya. She wants what Maya has. We are jealous when we think someone we care about likes someone else more than us. But we feel envy when someone else has something we want or desire but can't have. Another example is shame and guilt. Brandon was bothering Jose during morning work. Imagine if the teacher, Ms. Jones, said in front of the whole class, Brandon, you are never quiet. You never pay attention. You're impossible. Brandon feels shame after Ms. Jones reprimands him in front of the class. He feels humiliated and begins to believe that he is a bad student. Now imagine if Ms. Jones had said, Brandon, I asked you to pay attention to the morning work on your table. Then I 
to see you poking Jose. Your behavior makes it hard for the other students to learn. Brandon feels bad about how he behaved. He feels guilty that his actions may have distracted his classmates. Other examples of commonly mixed up words are frustrated and hopeless, satisfied and relieved, excited and elated. So when we talk about the granularity of emotion words, what I always talk about is that um, my background is as a school social worker. So if a child or an adult comes to me and says, I'm feeling frustrated, the better they can label their emotion, the better I can help them. If they are telling me something that's inaccurate or they're not able to process what's happening, like Craig said, a lot of times clinical work is very focused on just naming, right? Naming what you're feeling. And so I think that's an important, and, and the ways that I have consistently used emotion vocabulary incorrectly um, are kind of surprising. So when we talk about expression, this is where we see a lot of the withdrawal behaviors, right? Um, this is. When we, when we think about display rules, right, and what girls are allowed to express, um, generally we allow girls to be sad, but we don't really like it when they're angry. And we do the opposite for boys, and some boys, it, it's, not, it's not safe for them to cry um, in their families or in their communities. And so we teach them that anger is the way that they can express unpleasant feelings. And then they act angrily or aggressively, right? Because that's the only tool they have. Um, and withdrawal is sort of something much more, that is, tends to be more common for girls. It's not exclusive to girls who are experiencing trauma though. Um, so there's things that you can be on the lookout for, right? Um, irritability, especially if it's a change in children, that sort of fussiness. And when you talk about infants and toddlers, it really can be like just crying or not wanting to be touched. Um, it doesn't have to be uh, change in affect, right? It can be just a sense of irritability. Flat or vacant affect, though, that, that's another huge indicator, right? That my, like I'm just giving you nothing. Um, or dissociating, so you have a child who might be like staring off into space and not really paying attention, noticing what's going on around them. We already talked about the notion of being really clingy. So it could be to a person, it could be to a place or a thing. If we're talking um, something that doesn't seem typical for a child, not just like I have my wooby and I want it to be with me or my comfort object, but a real, really strong sense of um, needing to be with something or someone. The hyperarousal, so being in really high energy spaces a lot. Um, sometimes uh, really just not necessarily angry hyperactivity, but a lot of energy and a lot of activity, especially if it's different, is telling you something. Um, when we see more extreme behavior, like aggressive behavior, if you all of a sudden have a child who's throwing furniture, um, or you have a child that the whole time you've known them they're throwing furniture, it's not typical. Um, and children who feel safe and held don't generally throw all the chairs in the library. Um, they don't do it every day. Tantrums, crying, especially if, you, if it's a five-year-old, right? It's not typical for a five-year-old to throw tantrums on a daily basis. Um, or sometimes you'll see kids just crying quietly, um, not, not trying to get your attention, just sitting in the back crying quietly. When we talk about regulation, what you'll often see are children who have less ability to, they're just dysregulated. They're all over the place emotionally. Um, and you can't figure out the pattern because there isn't a pattern. We talk about children who have limited ability to self-regulate. So um, like Adam mentioned, right? We can't self-regulate if we're not given the opportunity to learn how. Then we do often see children who, even with the opportunity, because when you get into that squat, the quieter space in your mind when you don't have that support, that is oftentimes when um, the sort of trauma is reactivated or a flashback happens or a memory happens. And then the third point is relying on others for self-regulation. So these are the children who just, it's related to the attachment, right? They just need to be around you. They need someone else to help and that is adaptive, right? These are all things that happen to help us adapt to a world that feels unsafe. And so we wanna highlight these not as a way to sort of terrify you, but also to help you notice if these are things that are happening with the children that you work with, this is not an exhaustive list and it's not diagnostic, but it may help you to figure out, you know, because so much is framed in terms of behavior, 
right, which sort of everybody today has talked about, right? This is a problematic behavior. This is a challenging behavior. What is it, challengingbehavior.org? Um, so I need somebody to fix it. I need an ABA to come in and fix it. Um, and I can tell you some really fun stories about that, right? Uh, but, if it's, but when the behavior is predicated on an emotion state that we don't understand, what, what happens when I yell at a child because they're non-compliant? because their emotional sort of, their internal emotional core is reliving a trauma experience. What do I do to them? I further traumatize them. I tell them, school is not for you. And I don't care what you feel. Because in this school, we don't wear hats, right? And I know that's not as big a deal in early childhood as it is in elementary school, but. So when we push away what they're giving us, the data that they're showing us about their emotional lives, we are removing them from that space. We're furthering their trauma. And we're not allowed, like, what, what we believe is that we have these tools, right? We have these ways to support children in building their emotional intelligence. Oftentimes, emotional intelligence is framed as a thing you have or you don't. But we want to say that's not, that's not true. This is something that we can learn and teach and share. Mm -hmm. So part of the approach that we take at our center is um, actually similar to what we're doing right now that this is a message that's not just for the students. Um, this is a message that, that not, is not just about early childhood. So our approach um, starts in early childhood, goes through high school. So I have colleagues who work with high schools. I have colleagues who work um, everywhere in between. And like I said, some of the hardest work that we do is actually not um, uh, um, relative to students. It's actually the higher up you go. So when we work with a, a school, um, we often ask questions about this district that they're in. So tell me about your district initiatives and, and the things that at the higher level um, that, that you have to do as a district and the different requirements that you have to meet. Um, some of the um, tangible things that we do here in Connecticut is we have um, a professional development series for superintendents and principals. Um, and um, which is very similar to the work that we would do directly with educators. Um, but ultimately, all of these parallel one another. So when we talk about um, creating a safe emotional climate in the school, the approach, or excuse me, in a classroom, the approach and the tool is actually very similar to the um, approach and tool that we're asking the educators to do at the staff level. And then we're asking at the district level, the same thing, same tool. And this is part of um, what I um, see as the simplicity of the approach that we have when we're working with schools, is that the best strategy you can teach children is one that you use as an adult. The strategy you use yourself. So um, I have a three-year-old, and I taught my three-year-old how to take a deep breath. Actually, um, when he was an um, infant, I started this by modeling. So I would hold him on my chest, and I would and I would take an elaborate deep breath, and I would model that, and as he got older and older and older, we started talking about um, when I take a deep breath, and the different times he can take a deep breath, and when he was angry, I would, I would look at him, and I would say, let's take a deep breath together, right? So that strategy is a strategy that I use when I'm on 95 and someone cuts me off, right? Um, so a lot of like the best strategies are ones that as adults we recognize and we say these are these are strategies I use on a daily basis. This is a strategy I use that um, when I'm right before I'm getting I'm getting ready to walk into my boss's office and I have to um, and I have to to present myself in a way that's professional. If if that's a strategy that I've recognized as, as an adult and I found that it's effective and I've had efficacy around that, then it's going to be so much more meaningful um, when you teach it to young children. And let me tell you, the older children get, the more they'll see through the, um, the inauthent inauthenticity. Um, children, by the time they're in kindergarten, they start seeing through, through that do as I say, not as I do. So it's very much about setting an example and modeling, and it has to start at the top. If any of you have ever had an initiative where you felt like your administrator wasn't supporting you, um, that initiative is not going to last. I just, it's just not going to happen. That's what the research shows. And so that's something we've recognized and something we've incorporated into our approach. Um, that we um, feel it's important to, um, um, to work with adults. And something about um, what Sarah was, um, was talking about in terms of emotional intelligence um, and even the emotions matter piece, those things aren't, aren't just about, those aren't about um, just children. You may have been looking at those things and going, oh my. That's, that's my story as an adult. Many of us know um, that 
the adults that are in these child care centers and preschools are also either have experienced trauma or continue to, to experience trauma, and sometimes it's the, for the same reasons, because they're working in the community where there's gun violence, and so they hear those same gunshots, um, or it's their, it, it's their family member as well. Um, and a lot of everything we talked about um, in, in the morning was just an emphasis of that. Um, and so that's something that we try to recognize at our center, is that this work is just as much, as much about adults as it is um, about children. So in terms of the way Ruler works, um, first we start with the, um, the basic elements of Ruler. So the skills of emotional intelligence, um, some tools that make um, building those skills um, that much easier, and then the part as an educator that I, um, I love about Ruler is the pedagogical aspect. So when we bring Ruler to a school, it's all of, we have to first consider well, what is that school already doing? Because ultimately, to make it stick, we have to fit into that current practice. So I like thinking about, okay, what does the day look like? Um, and I think um, Adam's presentation gave a great sort of illustration of even the time that's spent in various things, from drop off to transition, morning meeting, small group, large group, um, free play, snack time, lunch time, rest time. We see those as opportunities to teach children um, the skills that we want them to have. It's an opportunity for a conversation. So if you use storybooks as a um, concrete example from this morning, storybooks and literature in that um, dialogue that you have with children is an opportunity to talk about feelings. And what's interesting is that feelings might already be in that emotion narrative and what is interesting about the emotion narrative. If you think about the books, um, does anyone watch, um, uh, let's see, uh, Game of Thrones, Handmaid's Tale, anyone? So um, are there emotions in those, those TV shows and those movies? Yeah, the emotions are part of why we watch them for the same reason that children keep picking up the book, those same books over and over and over again. Um, does anyone know the book No David? No David. Children love that book. Why? Because of how it makes them feel. So the way we see it at the center is that all these storybooks and all the experiences throughout the day are opportunities to be intentional about teaching the skills we want them to have. Um, so um, we have trainings. Um, we try to integrate. Um, we have a families team that focuses on work with families. Um, and ultimately, we're trying to do a couple of things. One, this idea that emotions matter. This isn't universally accepted. Um, all those things that we were talking about before, about how important emotions are, um, some people see emotions as a roadblock. They see emotions as illogical, as something that gets in the way. Um, and I would say that, well, that's only one side of it. The other side is that emotions can help you. They can help you be better, um, a better educator. Um, they can help you understand children. They can help you connect and form a relationship with children. So emotions matter. Um, the skills of emotional intelligence, and the other thing is the climate piece. Um, and ultimately, um, and, um, if you look at all the research that we've done, um, impact on what we call distal, um, proximal and distal outcomes. So not just on emotional intelligence and um, having children who are better able to navigate their emotional lives, um, get along better with um, their teachers and the peers in their classroom, but some of the other things, um, academic engagement, um, uh, bullying and, and so on and so forth because those things ultimately have the roots in those skills of emotional intelligence like bullying like a bullying is there's very much an emotional component of bullying and so if you don't address that directly you're just gonna have a lot of band-aids um, and it's something that you if you know anything about bu bullying research you sort of see like well great we have an impact but it doesn't last or the promise effect, um, effect size isn't as large as, as we thought it would be and so on and so forth it's four o'clock. It's four o'clock. Wow. Okay, so let's. Oh yeah, the final quote. So do you just wanna um, just wanna take it home, Sarah? Sure. I will read this to you. You may read it along. You may avert your eyes or close them. I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. And Dr. Maya Angelou wrote that. And that is sort of how we frame all of our work. And so we thank you for, um, for walking this path with us today and sort of encouraging our feelings. Um, and we're happy to take some comments and questions, even though it's 4 o'clock.
And we are putting our emails up because we want to uh, be available to you all. So even if we can't answer your question right now, or even this evening, um, we're happy to, to continue this conversation um, over email. And like we, I started with, this is very much a collaborative and a partnership that we see with you all um, in the work that you do in the, this community. Questions or comments? I know, I know, I know it's been a long day, but this is good stuff. We've got a lot today. Any questions? Thoughts? Hi, I saw um, you have one of your um, infographics where you talked about the need to start with administrators and your educators. And you have families near the bottom. Could you quickly speak to how your work um, incorporates families? Absolutely. Um, so many schools, um, either you're a preschool, you're a high school, um, um, if you're in the community and you work with families, you already touch families in some way. So when we work with a school or go into a community, the first question that we ask is, well, what are you already doing? So if you were, if you were an administrator of a school, I would say, well, I have some resources, but let's have a conversation about your family engagement strategy first, because I'm going to capitalize on that. Um, my children's uh, preschool, um, every year they have this event called the Family Stroll, the Fairhaven Family Stroll, so look it up. You could donate if you'd like to every single year. But they have this event where they bring in um, community leaders, community events, there's few food trucks, it's wonderful experiences for families and um, for community engagement, and everyone comes together, it's a wonderful experience. So as, um, as what I like to do is I like to say, well great, keep doing that. Let's talk about fitting that in. Let's talk about how we can enhance that experience. Some schools have curriculum night. Um, some schools do professional development workshops for parents. Some don't. Um, and ultimately, the resources of a school to do those things is it varies. So we're not going to come in and we're going to say, well, Rule requires you to do um, five parenting workshops a year. Because um, if any of you work at a school right now and I were to say five parenting workshops, you'd probably be hearing and you're just like, I don't think it's going to happen. Oh, but you might be the one person going, oh, we have a workshop series for parents, and that sounds like an excellent opportunity because we already do that. So um, we try to be respect um, respectful and responsive to what's already happening, but ultimately it's about the implementation um, plan that we develop at, at the, with the administration at the top um, and working with the teachers on a daily basis. Um, so it's really much a conversation, um, and a lot of this takes time and planning. Um, sometimes it's we're planning an event a year um, a year in advance. So it's a good question. And there's one more thing. You keep mentioning schools, but you're also able to focus on centers, preschool centers. Yeah, I sort of use those things interchangeably. So um, um, preschools, um, child care centers, um, family child care. Um, so early childhood to me is all inclusive. Um, and it's something that I, when I first started this position that I made um, uh, um, an effort towards is making sure that when we say early childhood, we mean sort of um, where all the different places where children are at. So schools, preschools, child care centers, all the different ways of slicing and dicing within the community, um, basically everywhere the children are at. Thank you. Anybody else? We have closing remarks next. I don't want to keep people too long. If there's any question or thought or comment, let's put it out there. No? Everybody's all set. Okay, Kim Oliver, our department director, will do the closing remarks. All right, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. And I promise you that these closing remarks are going to be really, really quick. But one of the, um, the tasks that Jane gave me was to figure out how we can wrap up the day. We had a lot of, like, next steps. But some of the things that I wrote down uh, was really focusing on how we advance adult practice. We just heard particularly about emotional intelligence, but we talked about a lot of things today that would include in that. And also building capacity and sustainability of our system overall. Some other key pieces were we talked about families and engaging families more and lifting up their voices. We talked about really educating others and increasing awareness on the role and impact of early childhood education. 
We talked about new workers and workforce pipelines in early education. And we talked about inclusiveness, especially as it relates to our family child care network. Advocacy, we were talking about it very specifically around compensation for our workers, but advocacy in multiple ways and how do we do more in that space. And also I heard equity and what do we need to do to ensure that we have a focus on equity in our work. So I want to um, tell you that we're going to do a lot of this and pull together our notes. We are going to send out an evaluation to all of you. We always want to do better, so please be on the lookout for that. If you have not yet done it, I ask you now to fill out your little uh, survey, your three uh, question survey. Um, and if you've already filled it out, please make sure you put it into one of the boxes for the mayor's challenge. And uh, some other quick reminders is that uh, we're gonna do a very similar event on May 25th. It's open to the public. Uh, so all of you uh, definitely are invited. If you're interested, you could go on Eventbrite and what we'll do is we'll make sure we get that information out to you. That is more um, uh, conversation on disrupting the cradle to prison pipeline. That one's gonna be more of a focus on uh, tracking de de developmental milestones of our young people ages 13 to 24 that will be here again at Artist Collective starting at 8.30. And also on June 9th at Parker Memorial Center, we are um, very fortunate to have First Books coming to, well, coming to Connecticut for the first time. Um, and our partners at Catholic Charities, uh, 40,000 books will be at Parker Memorial for a large age range. And uh, June 9th is actually the Saturday. We're going to have an event from 9 a.m. until 1, open to the public for families to come in and take books. But we also will have a special night before the Friday evening, uh, so June 8th, from 4 to 6 p.m. for our educators to come and get books. These are free books. Uh, we want to make sure that we're putting in the hands of all of you who are, we talked about the importance of literacy and language earlier, so please feel free to participate in that and we will send out more information about that as well. So uh, with that, I just want to do a final set of thank yous. There was a lot of information here today, so I want to thank you uh, to our, our partners at the National League of Cities for coming. Thank you very much, as well as Hartford Public Schools, correct? Uh, Hartford Foundation, United Way, and the Fund for Greater Hartford and all their support. Uh, the team of the City of Hartford, especially uh, my team at Department of Families, Children, Youth, and Recreation, for putting together this day. To our speakers who did such a fabulous job today from Julie and Jim to Tom and Adam, Craig and Sarah, and also to all of you, it was a very long day. We learned a lot. We again want to know more in terms of how we could do a better job of making sure we're building our ecosystem here so we're ensuring there's high quality early childhood education for every child in Hartford. So thank you so much and enjoy your evening.